everyone. Uh, today is Thursday, February 24th, 2022. This is the Senate Transportation Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, we have uh, four bills up today, and then we have an uh, informational presentation from the uh, State Patrol and the Office of uh, Traffic Safety. Uh, the, there are three of the bills that are uh, technically in the jurisdiction of the Capital Investment Committee, so we're only doing those on in, an informational basis only, uh, and those would be Senator Miller's Bill 1090, uh, Senator Dames' Bill 2787, and Senator Jasinski's Bill 2621. The uh, Duckworth Bill, Senate File 3226, uh, we will be laying over for possible inclusion. Uh, so to start with, we will uh, bring in uh, Senator Miller, who is, I believe, uh, appearing remotely. Yes, there I see you, Senator Miller. Miller. Uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, and uh, your bill, Senate File 1090, Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, this Senate File 1090 is a bill to recapitalize the Port Development Assistance Program at the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Minnesota's ports on the Upper Mississippi River and the Great Lakes provide access to global markets for much of our state economy. The ports help our agriculture sector move commodities such as soybeans, corn, and other grains uh, to markets utilizing our state waterways. Increasingly, our energy sector is using our ports both in Duluth and on the Mississippi River for shipment of wind turbines, blades, and towers, including here in Winona. All of us are touched by this commercial activity and all uh, and it all benefits all of us. Uh, for the past 25 years, the, Miss the Minnesota Ports Association has been the leading advocate for port development assistance funding. While they have made many improvements, they have a priority list of infrastructure needs that will make them even more efficient at receiving and transporting products. The priority list of projects uh, should be included in your packet. Speaking today on behalf of the Minnesota Ports Association is Lucy McMartin, Director of Community Development for the City of Winona. Uh, Lucy is joining us remotely and will provide some additional information, uh, and she's also happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you, Senator Miller. Uh, Ms. McMartin, there you are, suddenly appeared. Uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name of, with whom you are associated and proceed with your testimony. My name is Lucy McMartin and I'm the Director of Community Development for the City of Winona. And in that capacity, I serve the Port Authority. So thank you, Chairman Newman, for allowing me to speak today. First, I'd like to thank Senator Miller for being the chief author <coughs> of Senate File 1090. And I'd, I would also like to thank Senators Guggenbach, McEwen, and Pappas for co-authoring the bill. It's my honor to talk to you today about the Port Development Assistance Program, which is administered by the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Winona works together with the ports of Duluth, St. Paul, and Red Wing, and we have all used the Port Development Assistance Program to make critical port infrastructure investments that help all of Minnesota's economy. We arrived at the number in the bill in that each port authority develops a priority list of infrastructure projects. That list, just over the next two years, is approximately $35 million. And the PDAP, or Port Development Assistance Program, requires a 20% match. So the 28 million represents the 80% of those port projects. Now, with each investment we make, we improve the competitiveness of Minnesota in several sectors. While the activity uh, primarily is loading and unloading cargo from either ships or barges, uh, the benefit is shared all over Minnesota. For example, in Winona, our commercial harbor, as Senator Miller alluded to, handles corn, soybeans, fertilizer, 
and supports the agriculture industry uh, in all of southern Minnesota. We have expanded lately into windmill components uh, as well, but the harbor in Winona handles between one and a half to two million tons of commodities each year. Now Duluth Sports support supports the paper industry, of course, and their regional manufacturers receive their raw products through their port. In addition to that, finished products are shipped out of their port through the Duluth Seaway Port Authority docks. The Minnesota ports have all been keeping a pulse on the funding through the federal infrastructure opportunities, specifically the PIDP funds. Now, one of those components for that federal funding is that matching dollars have to be provided. And this is why state funding remains critical to help Minnesota ports improve their infrastructure in that we're all regional centers and we're transportation's hub. Now these infrastructures throughout our ports are very, very expensive. Um, and the infrastructure is old, 50 years old. I know in Winona here, we have some infrastructure over 100 years old. And the need isn't just this immediate 28 million. We have a list of projects amongst the four ports that total 125 million. So uh, it is really critical that we're able to access money to make these infrastructure improvements. Now, global demand for freight is projected to increase. Uh, it's supposed to triple between 2020 and 2050. And this is why waterborne transportation is so important. It is also the most fuel efficient way to transport product. It reduces air pollution, causes less congestion on uh, roads and the wear and tear on the roads. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have today, Mr. Chair, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about the Port Development Assistance Program and the funding request for 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McMartin. Um, members have any questions? I am not seeing any questions, uh, uh, Ms. McMartin and uh, Senator Miller. Uh, I, I would just uh, indicate to uh, the committee that uh, the ports are a vitally important part of our transportation system. Uh, and when you think about it, uh, we are sitting in the middle of the North American continent and we have a seaport uh, up in Duluth. Uh, we also have the, the river system uh, where goods are shipped uh, down to the Gulf of Mexico and, and from there throughout the world. Uh, we have the Mississippi, the Minnesota, and the St. Croix who all play a part in that. Uh, and it is, uh, without question, a vital part of our overall transportation system. Uh, and so, Senator Miller, thank you very much for bringing this bill forward. I, I, I think it's uh, yeah, very important that uh, we don't lose track of our port system and that we do, in fact, support them. The Duluth project, uh, we did tour this summer, and uh, so we've got a pretty good idea as to uh, what is going to be needed up there or what they are going to accomplish. And, and once they're done, uh, in my opinion, it will be money well spent. Uh, Senator Miller, any final words on your bill? Um, no, Mr. Chairman, I do think the, I believe the Senate Capital Investment Committee also uh, visited the Winona port and we had an opportunity to look at that project as well with Lucy and others. But just want to thank you, Mr. Chair and members for your time this afternoon. Thanks, Senator Miller. Uh, we will not take any action on this bill other than it being an informational hearing. So thank you again for presenting that bill. Uh, the next bill up is uh, Senator Dames, Senate File 2787. Senator Dames, welcome to the uh, Transportation Committee. Uh, and uh, whenever you are ready, please proceed. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, today I want to introduce Senate File number 2787. Senate file 2787 and is, a, is a request for funding out of the general fund for the Minnesota Valley Regional Rail Authority, which is a short, short line that runs from approximately Waconia down to Hanley Falls, Minnesota. 
and uh, we've been investing a lot of money in that rail line over the years and it's uh, really paying off because we've had a lot of economical development around that area and we have a lot of grain that's produced in that area and so there's a lot of shipment of grain on the rail which uh, every car load of grain takes off about four plus uh, semi loads so it's it's been a very positive move so uh, I, today I have with me uh, Commissioner Bob Fox, he's a Renville County Commissioner, but he also serves as the chair of the Minnesota Valley Regional Rail Authority. And years ago when I was on Minnesota Valley Regional Rail Authority as a county commissioner, uh, Commissioner Fox was on the, on the rail authority then, so he has a very good understanding of the, of the rail authority and the process, and uh, uh, we really do appreciate his service. So with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Commissioner Fox. Thank you, Senator Dames. Uh, Mr. Fox, if you would identify yourself for the record, tell us with whom you are associated, and then proceed with your testimony. Chairman Newman and Senators, thank you for the allowing me to testify today. I'm Bob Fox. I'm Renville County Commissioner, and I chair the Minnesota Valley Regional Rail Authority. The authority has been on a mission of rehabbing 94 miles from Norwood and Carver County through Sibley, Renville, Redwood, and Yellow Medicine Counties. We've rehabbed almost 37 miles and have bids out to do 10 more miles in the construction year of 2022. We are still in the running for a federal EDA grant, a matching grant of $3.6 million, which we hope to hear more about in the next one to two weeks. But it's always waiting and anticipating. The dollars that the authority has been granted has rehabbed the rail and has caused economic activity throughout the region. In the last 10 years, four shippers have invested over $18 million in building new facilities or rehabbing existing facilities. We will, with this year's project, be getting rehab rail to the first of these four shippers. One of these businesses, the Farmer Co-op Elevator and Echo, invested in a new grain handling facility last year with their members investing over $6 million. And it opened before the 2021 harvest season. The co-op believes that we will be able to provide rail service that will allow them to fill cars to capacity in the future, rather than the 92% that they are allowed today. Shipping cars weighing 286,000 pounds, moving trains at 25 miles an hour will make our shippers profitable and more competitive. Freight rail is important to the economic competitiveness of Minnesota and plays a vital role in movement of key Minnesota industries. The partnership between the Class 1 and the Short Line Railroads is valuable and essential for economic growth in Greater Minnesota. Freight rail and its infrastructure is under-recognized in comparison to other modes of transportation. Public perception of freight rail's value generally lags its actual importance to the economy and the communities it serves. Today I ask you for your support of Senate File 2787. The Rail Authority will continue its mission and continue to create economic expansion throughout our five counties that we serve. And as we celebrate our 20th anniversary this year, we'll be having a train ride on August 24th, so mark your calendars. Invitations will be coming out late spring. And again, I thank you, Chairman, for the opportunity to present and continue our story. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Uh, members, any questions? Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Dames, mm -hmm. for the bill, and I appreciated the testimony, and, and I support this bill. Um, uh, I understand that, you know, particularly um, across Minnesota, we have a track um, that are in poor repair, some of which um, used to belong to the class ones, but were turned back. And but for um, these regional rail authorities and some of this public investment in these smaller um, railroad companies, the shippers in those areas just simply wouldn't be served. And like Senator Dame said, uh, that would just be all that much more truck traffic and you know the attendant wear and tear on our roads and pollution and, and the like and, and be more expensive. So I, I appreciate this. I am curious to know though, um, do the, uh, I just don't know, do the, uh, do the railroads themselves make the contribution, How, you know, I, I heard about the federal participation that might come in to help bolster some of the state investment uh, in these tracks. Um, I think it's the Prairie Line that uses this particular stretch, which is a subsidiary of TCNW. Um, do they make a, a contribution to this track improvement? Mr. Fox, can you help us with that? Yeah, 
Um, Mr. Chairman and uh, Senator Dibble, uh, yes, they do have a lease with us, and they do pay <coughs> us a per car lease, and that do those dollars are reinvested. Uh, probably on the average, we're probably into the $100,000 per year that they reinvest into our system, and then we take the other dollars that we have through licenses and other fees and reinvest. All the dollars that we raise, we reinvest back into the track. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. That answers my question. Any other questions from members? I do not see any. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Senator Kiffmeyer. It's sometimes it's hard to, to watch the present members and the and the members on Zoom. Uh, Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. For some reason, my microphone disappeared from in front of me, and I know staff will take care of it. So that's good. Appreciate that. Uh, you know, Senator Dames, um, it, I was looking at this map that you have, and I thought, what an efficient way of moving all these farm resources instead of trucks on the road. I mean, the efficiency that comes from this and the pressure it relieves from the highway area and it's just highly efficient, but I was kind of amazed at looking at this at how how broad it is and and how um, how many entities it connects you know along the way as leads to, also leads to it. So I, I think so often you don't get to see this because I hear your words and I look at the bill, but mm -hmm. when you see the map, you know it really illustrates uh, the value that this brings and especially. Um, eases up on the roads and bridges, which otherwise would have to be used if you didn't have access to this kind of railroad to move farm goods and things like that. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank uh, you, Senator uh, Kiffmeyer, Senator Dames. Uh, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, <coughs> Senator Kiffmeyer. And, and there's a lot of, I mean, what you're saying is, is very, very correct. Uh, the other thing is, is that this rail will go all the way to Hanley Falls, and once we hit Hanley Falls, that'll allow us to tie into a, to a multi-state or national railroad, and so that'll give us an opportunity to ship our commodities, not only through the Twin City area and out, but also tie us into the railroads over there to give us the ability to ship to the, to those uh, more 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 western and southern markets. So that'll make a lot of difference. And this is a very highly uh, agricultural productive area. So there's a lot of grain to be moved. So thank you for recognizing the importance of that. Any other questions from members? Comments? I do not see any. Uh, Senator Dames, Mr. Cox, uh, again, the railroad uh, you know, for this freight is very similar to my comments that I made with respect to the ports. For a long time, our freight rail uh, was really disintegrating in the state of Minnesota, and I am familiar with the fact that there's, there is lots and lots of grain in particular. I think there's aggregate and other things that are really heavy. Uh, that move along these short line rail, railroads throughout the state of Minnesota and move into the Twin Cities and from there an awful lot of it gets dumped right onto the barges and goes down the river system. So uh, we will do our very best to, uh, uh, to support this request. Senator Dames, any final thoughts on your bill? Well, thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Do appreciate your uh, letting us uh, testify on Senate File 2787, and appreciate your consideration. Thanks, Senator Dames. With that, uh, Senate File 2787 uh, is uh, we're just laying over. We are or not we're laying not laying it over. We are simply not taking any action on it uh, because it is technically in the Capital Investment Committee. The next bill that we have up is Senator Duckworth's Bill 3226. This is a bill that uh, we will be laying over. Uh, Senator Duckworth, to your bill. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to present this bill. Uh, Senate File 3226 
uh, would appropriate $750,000 from the Rail Service Improvement Account to the Commissioner of Transportation for a grant to the City of Lakeville for planning and engineering of a freight rail car storage facility. Uh, rail cars are often shuffled from one track to another for storage purposes and in the process tend to block the entrances and exits of surrounding neighborhoods. This presents issues for residents, first responders, school buses, and anyone traveling in the vicinity. These funds would allow the rail cars to finally be stored elsewhere where they no longer uh, where they no longer present a risk to the community. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chair, I do have a couple of testifiers. If possible, I'd like to start with the mayor of Lakeville, who is joining us via Zoom. Thank you, Senator Duckworth, and uh, the mayor, uh, Justin Miller. Are you? I I am here, Doug Anderson. Very good. Uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, please identify yourself for the record, and uh, My name is Doug. proceed. Thank you very much. My name is Doug Anderson. I serve as the mayor of Lakeville. Thank you, Senator and Chair Newman, uh, for the opportunity to speak and to the entire committee. Um, Mr. Miller and I, Mr. Miller is our city administrator. Mr. And I, Mr. Miller and I are privileged to be here to share with you about this project that has been, um, we've been working on this for a number of years. And I want to start off by saying thank you to Senator Duckworth um, for him bringing this forward and for his recognition of what we've been working on for the past three, four, five years. Uh, Mr. Miller does have a presentation. I'm going to allow him to do that. But, but just as a summary quickly, he's going to discuss the public safety challenges that we have, the environmental challenges, and also the opportunities that we have in terms of economic development and, so, and supporting our, our uh, ongoing growing Air Lake Industrial Park and the businesses that are uh, that reside there. And he's also going to talk a little bit about our partnerships and how we look at proceeding. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Miller, thank you for coming to the committee. If you would uh, state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I and pull the sure mic. Thing. There you go. Sorry about that. Justin Miller. I'm the city administrator for the city of Lakeville. I do believe we provided a slide deck, and, and maybe if that could be brought up. Um, thank you very much. So uh, we are happy to be here today and are um, thankful for Senator Duckworth for uh, introducing this bill. Uh, if you go to the next slide, because we do feel like um, some pictures are really going to help tell this story. So we do have a challenge, which Mayor Anderson talked about in Lakeville. The challenge is that we have an obsolete rail line that runs through the city of Lakeville. It's owned by Canadian Pacific, but it is leased by Progressive Rail as the short haul provider. It, um, there are numerous challenges, like the mayor indicated. There's a public safety challenge. There are significant neighborhood impacts. Um, it does also impact our children. Uh, it does go by a school, as well as um, this line does cross several bus routes. This rail line actually goes over a lake. It does go over a part of Lake Marion, which can pre um, present some environmental challenges. And it is an outdated line that is not used for any rail traffic. Um, it's in a position that it cannot be hold cars at any speed and barely can hold cars um, for the sole purpose of parking those empty cars at this point. Next slide, please. So um, imagine if you live in a neighborhood and you see this out your back door. These are the cars that are parked in people's backyards in the city of Lakeville. So imagine looking out your cars or out your back door and seeing that. Imagine having to explain to your kids what some of this graffiti means. Uh, if you look at that car on the right, imagine that car filling up with water in the summer and becoming a breeding ground for mosquitoes. If you go to the next slide, please. Imagine trying to sell your house, like this, the slide in the top left, or having to sell your house because of not wanting to look at this. Imagine if you're in the top right, that street there is the only entrance and exit into one of our neighborhoods. Imagine that being blocked for 20 or 30 minutes at a time while they're moving hundreds of cars throughout the city. That has happened. Imagine seeing kids on the top of those cars, or imagine on the right hand, that bottom right picture, imagine those cars lining County Road 50 for over three miles throughout the city, a major corridor that people drive through every day, and imagine seeing that lined up. Next slide, please. And imagine seeing kids, possibly your kids, hopefully not, if you live in the neighborhood, but imagine the risk that this attractive nuisance provides throughout the city 
and um, the fear that something bad might happen to some of these kids who are um, using these as a form of entertainment. Next slide, please. As a frame of reference, Lakeville, a portion of Lakeville you'll see on the right, the bottom right circle is actually where the Progressive Rail headquarters is. Progressive Rail is a valued member of our business community. They provide a lot, they provide a significant economic development resource to our industrial park, not only in Lakeville, but to other areas as well. The line that Progressive Rail leases comes up from the south through Northfield to Lakeville, and then it proceeds to the northeast. For about 3.3 miles to that northernmost red circle is the most significant issue in the city of Lakeville. The zoomed in portion on the left hand side, you can see it goes directly through some neighborhoods. And the top circle is actually the part that does go over Lake Marion itself. This is just the most significant area that challenges the city of Lakeville. It continues through the northern part of Lakeville and then goes even further over 30, Interstate 35 into Burnsville, Savage, and in Bloomington. I should note, though, that once you get past this section of Lakeville, the rail line becomes in even worse shape, and so Progressive Rail does not even try to use that, that line even to store rail cars um, because it just is in such bad shape. This is the only part of the line that they do that. Next slide, please. The good news is there's a significant opportunity to do something about this. It would not only improve our nation's interstate commerce, but it would remove significant blight from the, our neighborhoods. It would provide a safe and modern rail storage and transload facility for progressive rail. You might have heard of a few of these companies who are in our industrial park, Boise Cascade, Upanor, Amazon, FedEx. These are all large national companies in addition to the hundreds of other companies in our industrial park that are supported by our, our, our rail service. So if you could go to the next slide, I realize this is small and it's hard to see and we'd be glad to get you larger versions of this. We do have an excellent opportunity to address this problem. On the right hand side where the red diamond is, you, that is the Progressive Rail headquarters. The line that they lease does come up from the south. Air Lake Airport is a reliever airport owned and operated by the Metropolitan Airports Commission. They obviously own land next to that, about 100 acres. Because of FAA safety regulations, that land has to remain vacant from buildings. But it, they do allow rail storage. And so what we are proposing is for a rail storage facility or a transloading facility in this area that would provide enough rail capacity that these rail cars would not have to be stored in Lakeville neighborhoods anymore. This would actually probably provide even more storage capability for them and it would provide a significant economic development opportunity as well. Next slide, please. So the status of this project, we do have uh, great support from our congressional delegation. Uh, we have had numerous conversations with our federal delegation as well as the Federal Rail Authority about funding opportunities and we are looking at those at, as we speak. We have an agreement with Progressive Rail that this is a solution to the problem. We have we are in the process right now of doing some very preliminary site survey work, and the city and Progressive Rail are sharing in the cost of that. That work is underway, and we expect those preliminary site work to, uh, to be ready this spring. Next slide, please. And then finally, uh, we have lots of key partners in this. The city and the county are involved. Our state legislators, as is evident today, the local school district is obviously very intrigued by this without so that um, bus traffic is, is not impacted. The businesses in the community, especially those in the, in the industrial park, would see uh, opportunities here. The property owner, which is Metropolitan Airports Commission, is in agreement. You would have numerous citizens, especially in the neighborhood, who would be very happy if this were to happen. And both Progressive Rail and Canadian Pacific are on board as well. So, um, Mr. Chairman, um, and the rest of this uh, committee, we are um, <coughs> thankful for this opportunity and supportive of this bill, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Um, looking at your, your slide, I, and I don't see a page number on it, but it's the one that's titled Project Status. Um, is the uh, sharing of the cost of the preliminary site work and initial concept designs is that is what 
the study will uh, reflect in, that you expect in the spring of 2022? Is that when you say it's going to be, is that what you're referring to? That is correct. The work that, and that's being funded solely by the city and Progressive Rail at this point. That is very preliminary work. The, the effort that uh, this bill would provide would take that to the next level and would then make this project very shovel ready for any funding, uh, construction funding that might be available. And uh, can you give us an estimate of the uh, cost of the study that you expect to come in in uh, next spring? That study that we're undertaking right now is we're spending 20. Yes, yes. where it says you're, that the city and Progressive Rail are sharing the cost. Yes. Uh, what are those costs? That cost right now is $20,000 that we're splitting between the two parties. And my last question is, do you have uh, an estimate as to, you know, this is a bill for $750,000 for preliminary planning, et cetera. Do you have an estimate as to what this ultimately this uh, project is going to cost? That is the goal of these studies, but our very, very preliminary uh, projections is somewhere between four to seven million dollars. I'm sorry? Between four to seven million dollars. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Senator Osmond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have about 15 questions, so I think it may be about an hour <laughs> of discussion, uh, but maybe I'll just ask one. Um, question, I, I guess I'm sort of curious, is this an ongoing problem that that has become more uh, um, difficult over time, or is this something that has been there for a long, long, long time, and you're just trying to deal with it now? I guess I'm trying to figure out where the urgency and when this occurred. Is it, did it happen four years ago, or has it just got escalated? Mr. Uh, Miller. Sure, thank you. Uh, Senator Osmick, Mr. Chair, it has been an ongoing problem for many years. It really ramped up uh, before my time with the city. I've been with the city for about seven years, but it's my understanding that during the Great Recession is when it really started to, to ramp up. Um, it really becomes a revenue generating opportunity for progressive rail, and it is um, at times intermittent. Sometimes these cars will be parked here for months at a time. Sometimes there's no cars at all. It's just it's an it becomes an opportunity for progressive rail when they have a client who is looking to store some empty cars somewhere. So it, it's not on a set pattern, it's, but it's ongoing, and um, it's been going on for, for many years. Mr. Chair, if, if, can I add Senator to that? Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Osmick. Um, the city of Lakeville has experienced a tremendous amount of growth over the last few years, uh, especially more recently, and the logistical impacts that these rail cars have as we're trying to grow, build infrastructure, develop new areas, uh, has been uh, felt even more pressing more recently. So as Mr. Miller said, it's been an ongoing issue, but it's been even more so as the city continues to develop and is busting at the, bursting at the seams, yet still having to deal with this pretty significant logistical issue. Senator Osmick. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so without question, when I take a look at these slides, I can definitely see the issues that you're talking about and sympathetic to that. A uh, couple questions. First of all, this is titled as a rail storage, but from the pictures I'm gathering, this is a rail car. It's the actual cars that you want to store. Okay. Mr. And, Miller. <coughs> that is correct. It's the actual okay. cars. Senator right. Kiffmeyer. And who owns those cars? Is that Progressive Rail who owns those cars? Mr. Miller. Uh, no, it would be the companies who are moving those cars. So I don't have any examples, but it could be anybody who's moving grain. A lot of times we've seen that they're frack sand cars. So they're individual or private companies that, are, that own those cars who are then just transporting them along the line. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so... Um, generally, when somebody is going to store them, it's within the city's responsibility, eyesore, you know, public safety and those kinds of things, uh, to set those by city ordinance. Do you have ordinances that govern this type of storage thing or eyesore public safety risk? Mr. Miller. Uh, we, ha uh, Senator, that's a, a great question. We have looked at every legal avenue we can. But the fact of the matter is we get um, preempted by federal law because of the railroads. 
on everything we can do, whether it's storage or graffiti. We are basically powerless to enact or to enforce any city ordinances because of the federal preemption. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. I mean, I think that gives context here to what we are dealing with. And then the other question is, um, generally, if you have a storage facility such as that built by the city of Progressive Rail, there must be revenues that would come and that would pay for that kind of storage. Would you then be able to capture that revenue and pay for ongoing maintenance or other things like that? Uh, and maybe you can expand on that a little more. Mr. Miller. Um, so the details of the business arrangement are still in negotiation. However, we know that the <coughs> Metropolitan Airports Commission will require the city to lease the land from them. So the city will be the leaseholder of the MAC property, and then we will enter in, the city will enter into a sublease agreement with Progressive Rail. The intent is to minimize and hopefully eliminate any impact to the local taxpayer for this transaction. And then um, the obviously Progressive Rail would set their market rate for how they would recoup their cost on the line that they are subleasing, on the land that they're subleasing from us. Just one more, Mr. Chair. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think the important thing is I want to see to it that the city of Lakeville, while this private company and all these kinds of things, that you and your property taxpayers uh, benefit from this. There's a lot of intangibles here that I think are really important, but also to make sure that those who are benefiting from a storage facility uh, also pay for that value as well. So that's kind of where my directions, but thank you. Answers were very, very helpful in understanding this project. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just want to uh, uh, say my support for the uh, bill. Uh, being in a uh, community and watching the, the rail car sitting out has been an issue that I've seen in, throughout my district. Uh, so I think it's a huge thing to help. Uh, and my real estate background as well, it does impact real estate values uh, with uh, home selling uh, near these uh, uh, cars where they're all lined up uh, for several, sometimes for several months. So I think it's a great bill and uh, look forward to uh, seeing it pass. Senator Pratt. Mr. Chair, uh, my question's already been answered. Thank you, Senator Carlson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm having a little trouble here of uh, deja vu all over again. We went through exactly. Are you Yogi? Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. But we we went through the exact same conversation a few years ago about the rail, the storage of rail cars, and the panorama it offered, and all the negatives. And I don't remember what we did. And I, you know, I'm really sympathetic with the city of Lakeville and. I'm, I'm concerned that we didn't do anything. I'm concerned that we had it all presented to us and it was a good idea, it was a good solution, but we didn't do anything. Does anyone remember that? Uh, Senator Carlson, I will tell you that I do not. Uh, I don't know if uh, any of the other members, if you do, please, you know, to that point, and I am not seeing any reaction from anyone, Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Mayor, is that is that something? Am I dreaming that up, or is that something that we went through before? I, Mr. I Anderson. Don't recall, I'm sorry, uh, Senator Carlson. I don't recall that. I, I don't. There might have been some behind the scene conversations, I, but I don't recall ever having a bill come <coughs> forward legislatively. I, Mr. Miller, do you remember anything? I do not. Mr. Miller. I do, I do not. We're drawing a blank, Senator Carlson. Well, you know, uh, Mr. Chair, we lost the lobbyist, uh, John, uh, gosh, and he brought us down to visit Progressive. Happen. And, yes, that's it, John Appets, yeah. And uh, he brought us down there. We talked through a lot of this, and I don't recall what what the outcome was, but... I swear that if we had the recording of that presentation of that particular problem, we could have replayed it today and it would have been exactly the same, the same uh, position, the same responses. And, uh, you know, it was, I think it was primarily brought up by the neighborhood uh, and they were very concerned about the safety of storing these cars, the panorama, the, um, 
home values that were affected, everything exactly the same as what we're talking about now. And Mr. Chair, I, I really don't want to fail again. If we missed something then, or we didn't do something that we really should have, I want to make sure that we don't miss that again. Well, Senator Carlson, uh, this bill will be laid over, so you will have uh, ample opportunity to, to do your research. Uh, but unfortunately, there isn't anyone that I'm aware of here on the committee that remembers uh, what the bill that you are referring to. So, but you'll have time to check into it, Senator. Great, uh, Chair. Senator uh, Johnson Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question is for the testifier, and I got a little confused with the introductions. I think his name is Mr. Miller, next to Senator Duckworth. That is correct, Senator Jensen Stewart. Thank you. Um, my question for Mr. Miller, um, and this could be uh, something that I would love it if you would follow up with me later, just directly, but it sounds like you've done quite a bit of research around what is and isn't legal for the city of Lakeville in terms of getting rid of uh, these parked rail cars. I've been studying this problem for a long time. Uh, I was uh, very active with the MAC down at Lake or at Air Lake Airport, so I'm, I'm really familiar with it. I would love to have the benefit of your research. Uh, right now, Is what, what do you think is the main barrier legally, whether at a federal or state level, uh, for you to be somewhat powerless against getting those rails, those rail cars moved. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and um, Senator Johnson Stewart. I'll be glad to provide some more information uh, when I get back to the office. I can provide that to you and the rest of the committee. Um, but what we have been told by by numerous legal officials is that it is simply the federal preemption issue. I'll give you an example. There was recently, within the past two years, um, these lines blocked the entrance to the neighborhood that I talked about for at least 30 minutes. And there is actually a statute that prohibits that. Uh, we, we issued a citation directly to Progressive Rail, and that ended up getting thrown out of court because of some case law. Um, that said that we could not do that. And so um, those are just some of the challenges that we have, but I'd be glad to provide you with more information. Senator Johnson Stewart, anything further? No, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. I do not see any other questions, and I don't see any hands up. Uh, Senator Duckworth, any final uh, words on your bill? Uh, very briefly, Mr. Chair, thank you, and thank you, members of the committee, for your consideration and thoughtful questions. I just want to thank Mayor Anderson and uh, Mr. Miller for being here, and I would also be remiss if I did not thank uh, Representative John Kosnick of Lakeville for his partnership and tremendous help on this bill so that we can uh, help alleviate this issue uh, in Lakeville. Thank you very much. Very well. Uh, Senate File 3226 is laid over. Thank you. Thank Next you. bill on the calendar is Senator Jasinski's bill, Senate File 2621. Senator Jasinski is presenting uh, via Zoom. Uh, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and apologize for not uh, being there today, but hopefully I'll be back there soon. Uh, but I'm excited to carry Senate File 2621 on behalf of the Minnesota Regional Rail Association and the rail shippers across our state. Uh, the Minnesota Rail Service Improvement Program, or as we refer to as MERCY, uh, is a grant and loan program that is run through MnDOT and provides funding for short line freight rail service improvement projects. Uh, these railroads are the first and the last mile of service for many of our businesses and shippers across our state. Uh, they assure the access to markets across the nation and support the economic vitality of our communities. Um, short line railroads move all kinds of freight uh, to and from Minnesota communities, especially in the rural areas where they provide the last mile of service for thousands of our producers, uh, hundreds of our manufacturers, and other rural industries. Unfortunately, the Mercy program has been woefully underfunded uh, since its inception, and this $20 million request is uh, only a small portion of the identified needs out there. Uh, but for a host of reasons, it is critical that we invest in our railroads uh, just as you've heard today, and uh, we've invested in our roads and bridges uh, for uh, our decades. Uh, the 2015 state rail plan conducted by MnDOT noted that Minnesota short line railroads have over $250 million worth of infrastructure repair uh, 
and replacement needs. Uh, I'm carrying this bill uh, to help address some of those costs and assure that the rail transportation remains a viable option for shippers uh, statewide. Uh, again, there's been several people talking about the rail short lines, how important they are. I think uh, Senator Dame said in an earlier bill, uh, for every uh, four semis can get uh, loaded into one uh, rail car and take all those loads off our highways. Uh, so I believe today I have Tina Ryberg, who's uh, with you today in front of you, uh, and to speak uh, in support of this effort. Uh, Ms. Ryberg is the Assistant Vice President of Administration uh, and Operations with the Twin Cities Western Railroad. I also believe Sarah Erickson, the lobbyist for the Minnesota Regional Rail Association, may be available there to answer any questions. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Tina Ryberg. Thank you, Senator Jasinski, and, and both are here uh, in the testifying uh, room, in the committee room. Uh, first of all, uh, Ms. Ryberg, if you'd identify yourself for the record, tell us with whom you are associated, uh, and uh, proceed with your testimony. Senator Jasinski, uh, Chair Newman, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on an issue that is uh, very important to Minnesota small railroads. Uh, my name is Tina Ryberg. I'm the Assistant Vice President of Administration and Operations for Twin Cities and Western Railroad. Uh, we operate 229 miles of track running from St. Paul, Minnesota to Millbank, South Dakota. And for the past 30 years, we've run through some of the most productive agricultural areas in western Minnesota, hauling, hauling grain, fertilizer, ethanol, lumber, limestone, and just a variety of, of farm products. I'm here today on behalf of the Minnesota Regional Rail Association, which includes 18 freight railroads, large and small, that provide service to Minnesota rail shippers. And first, allow me to convey how saddened we are to hear about your impending retirement, Mr. Chair. Um, you have been a champion for us as a freight uh, railroads here in Minnesota, uh, beginning on your tenure. So as a personal constituent of yours, thank you. Uh, we very much appreciate it here. Um, I'm pleased to speak in support of Senator Jasinski's bill. It will provide $20 million in added funding for the Minnesota Rail Service Improvement Program, the Mercy Program. It's a grant and a loan program. It's managed by MnDOT. It provides funding for improvements to shortline railroads and rail shippers. Shortline railroads are the smaller of the operations that provide that first and the last mile to local, mainly rural, businesses and communities. Senator Jasinski's bill will help offset some of the very expensive costs of replacing our state's aging rail infrastructure. Railroading is a very capital intense business. Replacing track, some of which is over 80 years old, can cost as much as $500,000 per mile. And replacing a bridge can cost a million to five million or even more depending on the length of the bridge. And the annual maintenance that we do to assure safe operations can run from $15,000 to $20,000 per mile. For small railroads that struggle to meet these costs, the Mercy Program can help them make upgrades to their infrastructure, which improves service for rail shippers and thus they generate new investments by the customers that they serve. We exist for one reason and that's to move stuff. Investing in Minnesota's short line railroads directly benefits the producers, businesses, and the communities that they serve. It keeps our economy strong, like our agricultural and our mining sectors, where we actually rank first in the nation of the movement of iron ore, and third and fourth respectfully in the origination of farm and food products. And finally, let me note that railroads move freight more efficiently with less impact on the environment. The average rail car carries three plus times more freight than a large truck, and locomotives are roughly three times more fuel efficient with 75% less emissions than trucks. States all around us have been investing in their railroads for years. And we wanna thank Chair Newman and Senator Jasinski for understanding the importance of doing that same thing for our state. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ryberg. Uh, Ms. Erickson, do you want to uh, just answer questions or do you want to testify? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm just here to answer questions. Very well. Um, any comments or questions from any of the members? I'm not seeing any. Um, I want to thank you uh, both for coming in. Uh, and I, I absolutely agree our short line railroads, as I indicated on Senator Dame's bill, 
really are important to us in Twin City and Western Railroad, which of course is in my district. Uh, please grant, or greet all of the folks in Glencoe for me uh, when you get home. And thank you again for taking the time to come in and, and testify personally for us. We're just really happy to get, be getting back into the game here and having people in the committee room. So thank you very much. Uh, we will be not be taking any, any formal action on this bill because it is in the uh, Capital Investment Committee and this was simply an informal uh, or an informational hearing. Again, thank you very much. Uh, with that then, the final agenda item uh, is uh, Mr. Langer and Mr. Hansen uh, are going to come in and give us sort of an update of what's happening with the State Patrol and with the uh, Office of Tra uh, Traffic Safety. <coughs> But if we start with Mr. Langer, if you would, I'm sorry, Colonel Langer, if you would uh, state your name uh, and uh, uh, with whom you are associated and, and proceed with your testimony, please. I will, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, I have the honor and privilege of serving as Chief of the State Patrol. My name is Matt Langer, and we uh, are going to rely on Jordan, I think, to do the PowerPoint just a bit out of sequence, but we can handle it. Um, so I do have... Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here in person. It feels odd to me, but in a really good way to be here versus uh, virtually. So if we can skip right to my slides uh, that begins some conversation about what's going on uh, specifically with the State Patrol in particular, but as it relates to our mission and some of the things that we have been called upon to do. Uh, if we go to this slide here, this is uh, jumping right into the heart of the issue. You know, I've been with the State Patrol for 23 years. Our mission is all about traffic safety through assistance, education, and enforcement. And this slide, uh, you see a really interesting depiction of what's been happening over the course of time as it relates to traffic charges or citations issued across the state of Minnesota and traffic fatalities. I know you as members of this committee are well aware that traffic fatalities have been off the charts over the past couple of years in a really troubling way. Um, I don't think, and I've never testified, that we can enforce our way out of every problem that happens on our roads, but it's a really key element related to keeping people safe, whether they walk, bike, role or love someone who does, uh, it's a key component. And so we can see that traffic enforcement has been dropping rather significantly and it almost is exactly juxtaposed against the traffic fatalities going up. Uh, next slide. Uh, if you look at this slide, really the key factor, and it's not any surprise to those of us who've been driving lately, uh, speed has really become the number one factor when we look at the fatal crashes. So. I know Director Hansen gets this question a lot, uh, and as do I, what's going on and why are the traffic fatalities up? And we say there's a lot of things at play, but speed is number one. Um, and I think this committee well knows, and Mr. Chairman, you and I worked along with uh, Senator Carlson and many others mightily on the hands-free law, because at that point in time, the number one thing I was hearing from people is, what are we going to do about everyone who's driving with a cell phone in their hand? And I think that law has made some good progress, and you can see some reduction in the distraction as a factor with fatal crashes. And again, a few years later right now, and every the number one thing people tell me is, what are we going to do about speeds because they're out of control on our roads? So the data indicates what we're seeing uh, and, and feeling as we drive around in our state. The next slide talks about, uh, really interestingly, the number of people cited for driving in excess of 100 miles an hour by state troopers. And you can see the data is pretty incredible. It's about three times as many last year as just a couple years prior in 2018, and 2022 appears to be pretty consistent so far with 2021. Uh, you know, these are, these are citations, as I often explain it to people, you don't drive 100, um, that's, that's an intentional decision to drive at that speed and put everyone else at risk. So, you know, we could have all kinds of conversation about 10 miles an hour over or five miles an hour over, but these are really incredible speeds that are driven uh, with intention. Uh, next slide. One of the things that we've done starting last Monday was you hopefully have heard about HEAT. HEAT has been around in some uh, way, shape, or form for many years. It started as a really interesting cooperative endeavor with DOT looking at data. It's highway data and how it relates to enforcement. Highway enforcement of aggressive traffic project. Uh, 
tonight is night 10, so this is the data showing after nine days, uh, our state troopers have been out and made 667 traffic stops, uh, primarily for speed, that's been our focus. Uh, one individual driving 104 miles an hour at a .19 on I-94 through North Minneapolis was a really good person to get off the roads. We've had six pursuits and 20 DWI arrests. Uh, different with this project was we put our aviation unit up about 40 hours of flight time intentionally over this work as, is, as it was being done in various areas because the number of pursuits we've had has really gone astronomically in the wrong direction as well. We have had 18 pursuits in about a week's period of time for the state patrol only in our metropolitan area, 18. Uh, that's an incredible number. And aviation is the one thing we can do right now to do a better job of managing those pursuits as safely as we possibly can, which means catching the person fleeing without putting other people in harm's way to the degree that we can. And aviation is a key component in that. So you can see some notable events. One of them was in the Golden Valley Robbinsdale area with a vehicle that had fled from the police and shot at the police. We were able through our helicopter to apprehend both of those parties, including one who fled on foot, ditched the gun, and was hiding in a residential area behind a garage. We were able to recover the gun and the individual um, who was involved. And then another one um, was uh, an individual that was being pursued uh, through intelligence by the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension with the assistance of Minneapolis Police Department together. Uh, this individual was arrested after a pursuit. He passed a uh, state trooper driving 90 miles an hour, fled, uh, went into a bar, uh, tried to steal clothes from people in the bar and get away in a different, uh, with a different appearance, but aviation was overhead, tracked it, and this individual was wanted for um, several other violent crimes, including some shootings and, and a warrant, as I understand it, for second degree assault. So uh, some pretty good work you know, after just nine days with some concerted effort related to our primary mission on the highways, doing what we do, traffic enforcement, to keep the roads safe, but also recognizing that the criminal element is mobile and feeling like they can move about a bit unfettered. And so uh, our, hopefully our efforts are paying off in, in terms of keeping people safer by suppressing some of the violent crime by doing our work with traffic safety. Uh, next slide. Really quick, because I know it's relevant for this committee in a particular that's just been incredibly supportive of the State Patrol, including funding last legislative session, uh, both here and, and in the House, to increase the, the complement, as we call it, or the number of troopers we have by 63. Uh, this shows the State Patrol applications, both for traditional and LEDO, traditional being those folks that wanted to get into law enforcement, have a degree in law enforcement in Minnesota, and LEDO meaning they have a two or four year degree in any discipline and then we'll take it from there and help get them trained to be uh, ready to go in our academy. So you can see an interesting dip in 2017 that we frankly can't put our finger on why that happened. Um, I wish we could, but we don't know and then an increase, and then you can see uh, the 2022 decrease. That num that date is about the academies, so the applications for the academies in 2022. Um, so we have, as the next slide indicates, right now 13 traditional applicants, 13 candidates in our academy. They're in week number two at Camp Ripley. Um, 13 is an incredibly paltry number. It's too low. Um, because if you look at the red number right now in that academy, we have the budget, we have the appropriation, we could have 60 people in that academy, and right now we have 13. Uh, Lido is at 17. That group is a few weeks into their collegiate training um, at 17, and they will complete that training before entering an academy later this year. Um, so this slide is, I think, really relevant and important as we grapple, like every other policing agency in Minnesota and, frankly, across the country, to figure out how we reverse this trend of, of kind of moving in the backwards direction in spite of our ability to move in a forward direction because of the additional appropriations we have. Um, I will say that uh, one of the things that, if you look at this slide and have been around a while, you might say, well, geez, you must have a lot of money with salary savings. And it's actually quite the opposite because the 63 positions that were appropriated last legislative session also had rider language that we as an agency don't have access to that money until we hire the people. And so we are facing some real budget headwinds. I know, Mr. Chair, you're, you're aware of some of those that we've visited about. 
um, some related directly to our mission, like the heat project that has a stressor on budget, but also related to some of the civil unrest work that we've been called in to do from a, from a preparedness standpoint, like right now with 100 state troopers that are in town uh, starting yesterday for the federal verdict that, that may apparently being read any minute now. And so our preparedness efforts have cost a lot of money, um, to be honest, uh, for, so that we can be ready for anything that might happen on the freeway or at the state capitol or when called upon by another agency to assist um, because there's uh, been a rather relentless cadence of events and protests and demonstrations and things that we really need to be paying attention to. Um, so we definitely have some budget things, including a deficiency request in the governor's budget to replace um, some trunk highway funds with general funds and to recover some of the general funds for state capital that have put us into a deficiency position as a result of previous events late last year and what has happened this year. Next slide, I think, um, gets right back to uh, Director Hansen, Mr. Chair, unless you want to stop for questions related specifically to the State Patrol or anything that I talked about. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to ask you uh, just two question, questions, then we're going to go on to Mr. Hansen. Um, uh, first question is, um, what is your take on the reason for the, you know, dramatic increase in the speeding? And my second question is, um, I'm aware of the, the, the concentrated effort to stop these speeders who are really, really dangerous. I mean, they really are. But I've also heard that, that you've received some, some pushback, some complaints about that. If you could comment on that. Those are my two questions. Yep, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. So uh, I, I wish I knew the answer to the first question. I know that this speed issue really peaked when the pandemic started and traffic volumes dropped. Um, I remember telling people I visited with some colleagues of mine around the country and, we, we, and closer to home, and we thought, this is going to be fascinating how this impacts fatal crashes. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we drop the vehicle miles traveled down to what we saw early on in the pandemic, we were sitting there thinking, we're going to have the best year we've ever had on traffic fatalities. Uh, we were dead wrong on that, literally. It, it had an opposite effect. And so I think it's a combination of lower traffic volumes, reduced enforcement, and the risk-taking population still driving and, and feeling as though they were empowered to drive a lot faster than ever. Um, I don't know why that hasn't really dropped off, because last year was worse than 2020. Uh, but I know that our state troopers are out there doing everything they can to intercept those drivers and to hold them accountable. And hopefully as traffic volumes come up and there's less opportunity to drive like that and our enforcement levels out in this state, we can see that making a difference. But of course, driving 100 miles an hour on the interstate is dangerous, but so is driving 50 and a 30 in some community across the state, as we've seen recent articles about pedestrian fatalities also going mm -hmm. in the wrong direction. Exactly. And the second question, um, Mr. Chair, re related, uh, you'll have to refresh my memory. I got so wrapped up in the 100 mile an hour thing. I'm just curious uh, as to uh, the fact that I've heard uh, you've had pushback or complaints about uh, enforcing the speed limits. Is, is yeah. that true? Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I I'm really aware of one group that uh, pushed back very early on against what we were doing with heat. Um, now, contrast that with what we've heard from Minnesotans since we've done this work. We've heard really positive things. Um, emails, text messages, social media posts um, really was validation that people are sick of the driving conduct on our highways and they want someone to do something about it. And they were very appreciative of the State Patrol stepping up and putting some troopers out there to make a difference. So some of the things that I was very thankful to hear were, you know, can you go to 694? Or can you get out to Woodbury? Like they're calling on us to go to a spot where they drive every day and they're tired of it. So. Um, again, early on, one, one criticism that, that was levied, but the, the vast majority of it has been very positive. And I'll be very clear, we went out specifically to target speed. So this wasn't about making traffic stops for all kinds of things that, that, are, that have been uh, bantered about politically and otherwise. This was about going after speed because that's the number one thing that's happening on our roads and the data indicates that it's absolutely killing people. And so it isn't that anyone was ignoring criminal activity or ignoring violations, but this was a very specific push for a specific 
reason um, that the data supports is really a challenge. So uh, we're going to reevaluate after tonight's 10th night and figure out what worked, what didn't, and what we should adjust to continue doing what we can because we know that uh, some of the traffic problems are only gonna, going to get worse as the weather warms up and we see those summer fatalities spike like they have in years past. I'm going to ask one more question, and I've opened the floodgates. There's a number of senators that I want to ask questions, and, and I am going to, but I will get to you, Mr. Hanson. I promise. I understand, sir. Uh, in in terms of the the enforcement, uh, have you noticed uh, any increase or uh, what is occurring within the the judicial system, where your troopers are writing tickets? I mean. Uh, do you feel that there are consequences for these people who are driving so dangerously? Are, are your uh, troopers feeling that uh, the judicial system is, in fact, appropriately prosecuting uh, the, for the offenses that you're writing up? Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, that's a great question. And frankly, I think it's one that requires research. Um, the topic of, of, you know, what's an appropriate fine and how much and what deterrent effect a conviction has or whether it's on a driving record or whether it, it stays off a record, I think is a really good conversation to be had. I mean, to be clear, it's a source of frustration for troopers sometimes when they see, you know, a certain violation and they, they, they do what they do so well and it, the interaction is great and then sometimes it's left them feeling a little lousy that it's continued for dismissal even though it was a really egregious driving conduct. Uh, but I wish I had data to point to to say, you know, 1 plus 1 equals 2 or X plus Y equals Z in terms of the question you're asking. I think it's a really good one. Uh, but as an agency, we believe in changing behavior. And so my message to troopers is take the enforcement action that you believe is going to change behavior. Sometimes that's a citation. Sometimes that's a warning. And I think your question brings up the, the, the fact that I often talk about is that when we, when we think about the system of criminal justice, it's not just the police. We've got to look downstream to see what's happening and how that relates to that ultimate goal of changing behavior when it comes to traffic safety. And I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I, I, uh, I, I suspect you didn't anticipate that question, uh, but fair warning, uh, next time we get together in the committee, I'm likely to ask you the same question. <clears throat> because I really am uh, interested in whether or not uh, there are consequences for that really, really bad behavior. Uh, Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Colonel Langer, for your presentation. I'm going to uh, maybe take a moment to promote my bill, Senate File 2898. Uh, that's the uh, uh, Highway Patrol aircraft bill, uh, funding some more uh, aircraft for the uh, troopers. Uh, can you explain uh, to, the, to everybody how important uh, that will be, what kind of things we can help with uh, with those new aircraft and, uh, and with the increased number of carjackings and the increased rate of speed, how important those things will help us across the state uh, to work to uh, promote uh, safety? Colonel Langer. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Jasinski, it's a great question. So I, I think it's vital. Uh, we're fortunate that we have a great aviation unit. We have really talented state troopers who are pilots, and we've had great support over the years to refresh some of our fleet. Um, it's vitally important. It's the number one thing, as, as I met with chiefs and sheriffs just two weeks ago uh, on Friday, it's the number one thing that I think we can do right now to mitigate this problem of police pursuits. Uh, because our policy as a state patrol is that once an aviation unit is overhead, an aircraft or a helicopter, we discontinue that pursuit. And then the logic is that someone fleeing realizes the police are no longer chasing, and at some point they're going to resume normal driving behavior. What they don't know is that we're watching them from the sky, and we have really good technology to know exactly where they are with street names and can just have, with exceptional precision, a better response to try to apprehend the person who's fleeing that is safer for everybody on the road, including the law enforcement and the person who is who is fleeing from the police. So um, it's absolutely vital, and I'm, I'm eager to, to have additional conversation. Senator Jasinski, as your bill perhaps moves forward on that topic. Senator Jasinski, any follow-up? 
Thank you. Just just to follow up comments, and I was fortunate enough to spend a whole evening up with uh, Trooper 8 one evening and saw how really how valuable it can be. And then just uh, talking with the pilots and the and everyone else that the people don't realize there's a lot of downtime uh, with aircraft for maintenance and things like that. So to have uh, aircraft that uh, don't have to go through all that maintenance at the same time and just with these new aircraft, what that will do, it'll allow uh, more aircraft time up there. Uh, so we'll have a lot more time in the sky. Uh, because we obviously those aircraft do need the maintenance. They have to go through routine maintenance uh, for any aircraft. And so with the, given those hours, it's just very important to make sure those uh, more aircraft up that they can be maintained uh, to make sure we have uh, aircraft in the sky at all times or not all times, but all peak times. So uh, thanks again. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, great presentation, really interesting and appreciate everybody's contributions here. But one of the things I wanted to go back to a little bit was when you talked about during the time of the pandemic, there were less cars on the road, so you had less presence, and the assumption that meant there would be less <laughs> violations of that and not being the case. Uh, it makes me think of how your presence is a deterrence. And I would probably suspect that a lesson learned during this time was next time to not let your presence abate because lives are at stake and your presence there isn't just about giving tickets, but it's about saving lives uh, from excessive or violations of all of that. So that's what I, I kind of think of that as something that we can take from that and the importance and the value. Uh, one of the things was uh, in taking a look at some of your statistics, though, uh, that as you continue to document what you're doing right now, and certainly the uh, safety that comes from following a violator in the sky instead of on the road where there's a danger to innocent people, um, supporting that, I think, is absolutely crucial. And also, sometimes you find when you have a a plane and it's down so much for maintenance, sometimes that value to lives is having something that's newer, can stay in the air longer, and also comes with a lot more value as well as the technology has increased. So are you planning to kind of continue this long-term look at continuing to see this pattern so that we can have more of those lessons learned? Colonel Langer. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Senator Kiffmeyer, so it's just a great question. Uh, we're working right now on um, more of a public-facing exposure of what we've done on the aviation side over the past uh, 10 days. And so our pilots are really proud of the work they've done, and they said, they said, Colonel, you wouldn't believe it. We've been involved with the apprehension of 14 people directly because of aviation assistance. Now, those are 14 arrests that didn't involve a use of force. Those are 14 arrests that happened without incident because of the good work and coordination. So uh, I'm very passionate about it. it. It's not the panacea, but it's absolutely something that we can do right now that seems to make sense from every side uh, of the equation. It's not cheap. It's expensive. Uh, but we've had great support, and I, I hope to continue that. And, as I often say, uh, when it comes to aviation, if you want two helicopters, then you need three. You know, if you want one airplane, then you need two, because there's an incredible amount of maintenance, and the maintenance takes time, as Senator Jasinski pointed out. And as it gets older, it takes more time to keep it airworthy. So uh, we certainly don't have anything that isn't safe. We have two helicopters and a fixed wing of Cirrus. Uh, those are the three platforms that work for that are, are effective for this type of work, and so eager to have additional conversation and ask questions about what we do from an aviation perspective and how that ties into the traffic safety mission that we are charged with. So, Mr. Chair. Senator Kiffmeyer. Yeah, I just wanted to follow, too. Um, let's not underestimate not only in that the capture and the arrest, but also the sparing of lives um, saved in regards to chases. So uh, this directly attributes to that, and it is about public safety, and it's about catching those who are dangerous uh, to public safety, but also protecting the public in the process of doing that. And so thank you very much. Appreciate it. Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Colonel Langer, I was, I was amazed at the, the chart on applications and then the high number of vacancies you have in your academies. I'm just kind of wondering, how, how is your staffing compared to what you would consider to be fully staffed? Colonel Langer. 
uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, great question. So the, the easy way for me to explain it is that I predict over the next year, uh, we're going to move backwards a little bit. So we're doing better than some agencies, but uh, it pains me to say that we can't, we're not going to be able to hire enough people to stay where we are right now. Um, and that means that's troubling to me, but it's, it's more troubling that we can't make any forward progress on the 63 new positions that we had great legislative and support from the governor on last session. And so um, our work right now is, is everything about not moving backwards, and we are. Uh, a little bit and so every every person that we hire this year we lose about 2.8 troopers per month so call it about three a month 30 to 40 a year leave just for normal attrition retirement separation life circumstance changes um, and so when we when you see that we're only hiring 30 with Lido and traditional this year uh, simple math says we're going to slide backwards a little bit Senator Pratt thank you Mr. Chair, so it sounds like you're, you're a little under what you'd, you'd classify to be a, a fully staffed uh, group. And, and, you know, we see you every day here at the Capitol, right? You guys do a great job of, of you know, protecting the, the Capitol grounds. And I've talked to some of your officers, and they talk about how, you, you know, they're coming off their, their normal patrol to be here. Some of them are working overtime. Uh, maybe talk about the overtime that your troopers are having to pick up and and what's the impact on morale that you're seeing? Colonel Langer. Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt. So, you know, that question's a difficult one for us. You know, our troopers are extremely resilient people. Um, I'm proud of them every single day for the work that they do. Uh, right now, I would say the biggest challenge for us is, you know, we have about 100 troopers or so in town, plus others to deal with preparedness. They're from all over the state of Minnesota. And so the number of our staff that have spent 20, 30 nights in a hotel over the past year means they're not at home, they're not with their families, you know, uh, mom isn't there, dad isn't there, depending on who's deployed. So they're extremely resilient, but they're also tired of that. They'd rather stay home and do their job and live their life and, and, and not have those uh, unforeseen deployments. So that has had an impact. Um, the other thing is, as I have pointed out organizationally, this has been a real Minnesota winter. Like, this is a real one. And um, those state troopers that have been out there every single day, whether it's snowing or blowing wind or ice or rain or all four in the same day, they've had a tough winter of doing the job. And that includes our dispatchers who are taking phone calls just relentlessly through those storms. Um, so we have a lot of factors that play into the challenge that, that is in front of them about how they continue to do the work with a smile on their face and be proud of what they're doing. Um, we don't, as, an, as a culture, force a lot of overtime, but there's been a lot of overtime opportunity for additional enforcement, and some of these deployments include overtime. So um, the appetite to work a ton of overtime is not super strong right now because they have a lot in their life. We're a young organization. They have families. They have things that they uh, need to take care of us outside of work. But um, never a day goes by that I'm not incredibly, incredibly proud of the work they do. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Colonel Langer, thank you. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we really respect the, the job that they're doing. And, oh, my gosh, you're right. I mean, this has been a real winter. Back-to-back -back really cold days out there, too. So uh, thank you. And thanks to your team for what they do. Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um, Colonel, it's good to see you, albeit remotely. And uh, I want to thank you for um, uh, the, the heat uh, attention out in Woodbury, you know, driving back and forth on 94, I am certainly familiar with the problem. And uh, I saw the notice that you were going to be doing this before it started, and I saw that 94 out here was included. And um, certainly with the proximity to Wisconsin, I'm sure that adds some incentives for people to get on out of here. Um, so anyway, it, it, I appreciate that. Um, I also wanted to just... Uh, appreciate the conversation about what is causing this, what has caused these um, behaviors to increase. And I think it's really important that, you know, if we're going to try to solve problems, we need to make sure we understand them. And, you know, the past couple of years, in addition to what we've seen in terms of, of driving behavior, we've seen a whole bunch of other 
aggressive behaviors in very different settings, whether it's domestic violence and um, child abuse, whether it's, um, uh, I just traveled this week, um, you know, there's been so many reports about increased air rage, um, and not to mention other types of crime and other aggressive behaviors. Point being, you know, as we're asking these questions to you um, with the State Patrol and the Department of Public Safety, but also for us and the work that we're doing, I, you know, we need to make sure that we are, are really seeing what the underlying issues are because this has crossed so many aspects of our society. Um, and uh, that is going to be the best way that we're going to ultimately understand it and hopefully come up with some solutions. But I really appreciate uh, I appreciate the aviation. I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Senator Jasinski, good bill. Um, and uh, you know, let's we, we need the tools we need to do it, but let's let's keep an eye on the big picture as well, because this is absolutely obviously a very historic time. Um, for our whole planet. And, um, uh, you know, we will be sorting through this for a long time. A lot of that research is already being do done now, and we should pay attention to it. But thanks for, to you, Colonel, and to your team for everything you're doing. Appreciate it, as always. Senator Kent, thank you for your remarks. Uh, I think uh, you are absolutely bang on. So thank you for those remarks. Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And nice to see you again, Colonel Langer. Uh, I, uh, I have about five questions, but I'm going to reduce it to one statement and a question because in the sense of uh, uh, keeping time here. Um, the one thing is that I am seeing an increase in the use of handheld cell phones recently. Uh, surprisingly, that we have more examples of people who don't have to have handheld in their automobiles. They have Bluetooth connections. But I do see more people speaking on handheld ones. Yeah, and I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. My question, though, is uh, a little bit more on, the, on the, uh, the issue of this bill, is I'm wondering if, uh, if, you're, if you have the tools you need, the latest tools you need, and if there are any tools that you see coming over the horizon uh, very soon, for instance, perhaps even using drones for, uh, for chases. Uh, if you all, all you need to do is go to YouTube and look up some car chases, and you see, especially Los Angeles, has some very highly technical chase equipment where it shows the speed of the car, the, the street that it's on, uh, the streets that are coming up. Uh, and there it's, and I'm, I'm not sure if that's all from the, the chips, uh, because it's, they're usually the radio, uh, the, uh, radio stations or, or TV stations that are doing it. But is there, is there any lack? of tools that you need for uh, handling this, because I think, uh, like you say, this, is, this has gotten, gotten to be a, a, a real pandemic, again, of, uh, of high-speed driving. And, you know, I, I tend to like to drive fast, but what I'm seeing is that people are going by me like I'm standing still. And I don't know exactly why and how this has gotten such an increase in the last few years. Maybe it's because of quiet cars, more powerful cars, all of that sort of thing. But somehow it is, uh, I don't think it's leveling off. I think it's increasing. And when I was up uh, at the, uh, uh, the construction site up in uh, Maple Grove on uh, 94, they were telling me that even though they have 60 mile an hour signs posted uh, for the construction zone, they were clocking cars at over 100 miles an hour frequently, and some at 120 miles an hour through a 60 mile an hour zone. And there's a lot of things I don't understand in life, but that's definitely one of them. Why would people uh, not pay attention to something that's so dangerous to drive that fast in a construction zone? So sure. if do you have any uh, um, reflection on the tools that you need besides just aircraft? Is there other tools that you are aware of that maybe we don't, uh, we aren't aware of? Senator Langer, the, the, the question I think is, do you have the tools necessary to do the job? 
Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Carlson, I, I would say that there's a variety of technologies that are helpful. Aviation is good. Uh, there's different pursuit technologies, but I'll, I'll tell you the number one tool is the human being, That's that, that, and that's, that's our number one need right now is the people. So happy to further that conversation with you. Thank you, Colonel. We are now, we're going to now go to uh, Mr. Hansen. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, Mr. Hansen, as you can see, the members are really quite interested in this public safety issue. And uh, I, I'm very anxious to hear what you have to say. And in particular, uh, I'd like it if you would bring us up to date on the school bus camera issue. Uh, th that is something that is uh, uh, really an important issue that we are watching. So, uh, Mr. Hansen, if you would identify yourself for the record uh, and please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Mike Hansen, and I have the privilege of serving as the director for the Department of Public Safety's Office of Traffic Safety. And I'm going to go through the slides fairly quickly because they serve as really a good reinforcement for what Colonel Langer covered uh, with uh, all of you. And the first slide you can see, you know, this is we've seen the problems in Minnesota, and particularly with speed and with unbelted and, and all of the aggressive driving that's taking place out there. This is not just a Minnesota problem. Many other states across the country are seeing similar issues on their roads. And as you can see from the, uh, the information on the slide, uh, there are even a couple of states who have suffered uh, more significant changes than Minnesota. But a 37% increase in the fatalities over the last 24 months, that's almost unprecedented in Minnesota history. We'd have to go back to 1943-44 to see the same type of percentage increase that took place in the deaths on Minnesota roads. Next slide, please, Jordan. Um, as everybody was uh, well aware, VMT plummeted. Um, I've just been, I'm wondering if... Just one, just one. Mr. Chair, no problem, sir. Um, as we previously covered, um, uh, with the onset of the pandemic in early 2020, vehicle miles traveled, or the number of vehicles on Minnesota roads did go down considerably. At, at a couple of points in time, it was half of what it was before. And so that greatly reduced, reduced congestion. There was a lot more lane space for drivers to use and abuse, and, and they did. And uh, as uh, Colonel Langer covered, they continue to do so today, even though, you, as you can see in the slide, that VMT has recovered to just about where we were pre-pandemic. And so these high-risk driving behaviors, these dangerous driving behaviors are continuing and we're paying a horrible price for that on Minnesota roads. Next slide, Jordan. As you can see, this is the fatality tracker uh, since 2011. And you can see, you know, we were, we were on a plateau there, somewhere between 350 and 400 fatalities a year for uh, a number of years until 2020 came along. And uh, again, as Colonel Langer pointed out, we fully expected, and historically, every time VMT drops, fatality rates drop in a, in a similar way to that. But within a month of, of the reduced VMT on Minnesota roads, our speed fatalities were almost 100% higher than they were in 2019. And that increase continues to this day. And uh, the number that you see there for 2020 uh, in 2021, that 498, that's actually 500 fatalities on Minnesota roads on our, based on our preliminary uh, statistics from last year. The last time we saw that was in 2007. So we've literally taken a step back 15 years in the traffic safety progress that we've seen on our roads. Next slide, Jordan. Speed-related fatalities, uh, that is by far and away the leading cause of it. If you look uh, back, uh, the increase since 2019, 116% um, higher than what it was. Uh, again, an unprecedented increase, but when you combine speed, unbelted drivers, impaired drivers, and distracted drivers, um, you have uh, a recipe for the mayhem that we're seeing on our roads. And it really is mayhem, and innocent lives are being lost. Every one of these crashes that we're talking about are completely preventable, and it's all, you know, the human factor that goes into that. And that's what the Office of Traffic Safety really focuses on, is trying to find the ways and the methods and the techniques and the countermeasures that change driver behavior. 
Certainly, we've worked very closely with the Colonel and with his crew and with over 300 law enforcement agencies across the state because enforcement and consequences is one of the most effective ways to change driver behavior and not necessarily just for the short term, as many studies have shown. Next slide, Jordan. So what did we do? Well, it became very apparent in, in 2020 and into 2021 as uh, um, I've heard a term, you know, we have a, an epidemic of roadway fatalities and serious injuries that's occurring within a pandemic of, of COVID proportions. So uh, in uh, 2020 and continuing into 2021, we partnered with the State Patrol and again, with over 300 law enforcement agencies across the state to provide them with extra resources that they can use for enforcement and to a certain extent to outreach and education programs to get Minnesotans to understand why it's important that we follow the rules of the road. Because that's really what we're seeing out there is a, is a, a not all of the drivers, not even many of the drivers, but a significant number who are disregarding those rules of the road and they're treating it as a personal playground. And as a result, innocent Minnesotans are being killed because of those ill-fated decisions. So we leverage our federal funding. We've provided some additional resources. We're continuing that into 2022. Uh, and with the uh, recently passed infrastructure bill and the U.S. transportation bill, that is also going to uh, give us some additional freedoms to spend that federal money in some different ways. But it's also going to be a, a, a budget uh, increase for us in a couple of areas that, that are going to be very important for us. And then finally, public media attention is what uh, changes that driver behavior. And if we can keep the profile there, um, we can keep Minnesotans focused on making good, smart decisions behind the wheel, and we can get us back on that downward trend, which, and this is the, the slight ray of hope, over the last couple of weeks, we've been tracking um, the, the year-to-date fatalities. And as of today, we are nine lower than we were at this time last year. Now, two weeks does not a trend make. And as the Colonel said, we've had a real Minnesota winter. And when that happens, speed goes down. When speed goes down, injuries and deaths go down. So it'll remain to be seen if we can maintain and sustain that uh, declining rate, which is going to be important to carrying us forward. And then finally, Mr. Chair, uh, on to the school bus stop arm grant program. Um, uh, this was authorized uh, during the special session last July, uh, and it brought uh, a little over $7 million per year into the Office of Traffic Safety for a grant program to pupil transportation providers, whether it's a private uh, a bus company or the school districts or, or whatever that entity happens to be, to install stop arm camera systems on their school buses. So when this project came to us, we started to develop the uh, RFP or the request for proposal to go out to the school district so they could apply for these grants. Now there's a state process that goes with that. The Department of Admin uh, is in charge of that. So some parts of that application process are out of our control. But what we tried to do was really strive for simplicity and ease, understanding that many of these pupil transportation providers are small mom and pop operations, medium sized companies, and there are a number of, of large companies as well, but not everybody is going to have the resources to do these grant applications to the extent possible. So we tried to keep the, the application process simple and, and streamlined and straightforward. And because we wanted to start to get the money out and get it going to work as fast as we could, we broke it up into a phased application approach. So phase one opened on November 9th uh, for uh, providers, uh, transportation providers to apply for the grants. That uh, round closed on December uh, 3rd, I believe. And we had 32 successful applications. And as a result of those 32 successful applications, uh, we'll be spending about $3.5 million and we'll be equipping roughly 1,700 buses across the state with stop arm camera systems. And a little bit of perspective on why this is so important. When the media release went out um, announcing this program and the grant awards, um, a couple days later I received a phone call from a bus driver who uh, operates in the South Metro area. And he was so thankful that we were somebody was finally doing something to protect his kids. And he went on to explain to me that um, he usually drives two to three routes a day, uh, but he's had to cut back on that because uh, on one or two of his routes, it's not unusual for him to have four or five people 
drive through that extended stop arm while his kids are off the bus. And it created such stress for him that, that he just had to step back a little bit from that route. And so he's excited about this. It's gonna put a, an important education and an important enforcement tool uh, out on the roads that will protect our most vulnerable uh, road users when they're at the most vulnerable, going to and from going, coming from school. Kids shouldn't have to be afraid to get on or off that bus, and parents shouldn't have to worry about the safety of their kids as they get on or off that bus. So it's, it's been a, a, a very successful, very popular program. Um, it's been picked up by the national media. Uh, it's been picked up extensively by local media. We have phase two application uh, process that is ongoing right now. And we, when that closes, we will have another three and a half million that we'll, we, we will allocate. And then finally, phase three, which kicks in with uh, state fiscal year 2023, we'll have the full seven and roughly seven and a half million uh, remaining to uh, award to districts out there. Now, there are roughly 12,000 buses uh, in Minnesota that would qualify for this type of system. Some of the, the bus companies did already have these, but not many. So we're gonna try and get uh, this out to as many of those as we can. And uh, the response has been uh, uh, almost statewide, it's not just Metro, it's not just greater Minnesota, but it has really been everywhere. Um, and grants as small as five, $6,000 for two or three buses to one of the large providers who is receiving just over a million dollars uh, to equip uh, roughly, uh, I wanna say a thousand of his buses um, that will benefit from this program. So um, it's, we're excited to have it out there, we're excited to have it rolling. Um, it took a little longer than I anticipated to get a coordinator on board, but now that we have Raya on board, she's been doing a really great job, not only with managing it, but with marketing and selling it. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair and members, I would certainly be happy to answer any questions if I can. Thank you for that, that report, Mr. Hansen. Uh, this particular program, uh, I, I really believe is important. Uh, I, I have to admit that uh, until this 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 program, this idea of school bus cameras came forward, uh, I really didn't understand the the danger and the number of violations, which are just thousands and thousands of violations uh, every year. Uh, and so uh, I really, if, if there's any way that your office thinks that we can help in any way, uh, I would ask that you please let us know. I realize this is a new program. You're just getting started. I will tell you that I do have a, uh, a school bus company in my district that has contacted me and was somewhat frustrated over the application process. I understand you're trying to make it simple. Uh, but And of course, there's always, you have to be careful who you give the money to. Uh, I'm gonna encourage him to go back and take another swing at it. Uh, and, and hopefully uh, he'll be successful this go around, but the, the application process, whether you want to maintain the integrity of the program, it also really has to be fairly easy because right now they don't have a lot of extra time. Uh, we've got the, the, the owners are driving school buses. They, they, they've got everybody that they can possibly hire out there driving these buses because it's such a shortage of drivers. So I'm gonna ask him to come back to you and, and, and take another swing at it. And, if there's anything that we can do to help you, uh, please let us know because this is, I'm absolutely amazed. I, it's a miracle that we haven't had a fatality. I mean, I can't believe that that hasn't happened yet. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is, you got an important job going on right now, Mr. Hanson. You really and truly do. Uh, members, any comments or questions that you may have? I am not seeing any. Gentlemen, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, uh, good presentation, and, and uh, don't be surprised we invite you back. Probably gonna be after the first deadline, but we, we might just have you back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, with that, members, our agenda is completed for the day, and we are adjourned.